Have you ever been imprisoned? Please, please don't feel the need to raise your hand. But that loss of freedom, regular commonplace freedoms and decisions that you surely take for granted, such as coming and going when you please, when and what to eat, who to see and speak with, when to sleep, and so on. The loss of freedom is a shock to anyone's system, even if it's just for a day, and can be devastating, even debilitating, if it's long-term. As such, the prisoner can be in dire spiritual danger of despair. It is surely one reason why our Lord tells us to visit those in prison. But have you ever been imprisoned? What of the bondage to and under sin? Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So have you ever been imprisoned? Well, have you ever sinned? Have you disobeyed God? Have you loved him with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul, and loved your neighbor as yourself? As you know, these are rhetorical questions to which the accusing law and conscience give true convicting answer. Because rather, as you know, you worry about and even doubt God's care and provision for you. And if you do love your neighbor, it is usually more like possessiveness or selfish use even for your perceived emotional or other needs. Indeed, you are such a great sinner that even just your sinful inclinations, let alone deeds, are like the craving for salt of a person who is dying of thirst. What I mean is the wages of sin is death, and yet, knowing this, still you sin, often and in many ways, repetitively, even addictively. And so the verdict of guilt has rightly been pronounced, and you were imprisoned. And then you heap guilt upon guilt by trying to rationalize it away, but really simply end up burying it deep inside of you where it's then stuck. It will never go away. That way is an endless bondage unto guilt. You cannot free yourself. And I mean that very literally. Because not only are the fortifications of conscience too great and the chains of the law too heavy, but even if you somehow were to escape, it's a deception. You are still guilty. And thus, a fugitive from justice. And trust me, the law will hunt you down and find you. There is ultimately no escape from its verdict. So whether it's the Allegheny County Jail or your sin, prison is a horrible place to be. And St. Paul writes to the Ephesians while he is in prison. Specifically, he writes this joyous, effusive, glorious prayer that is our sermon text today. How can he? How can he drop to his knees in praise to God at such a time? How can he gush about the Lord and about the church in the way that he does while he is imprisoned, persecuted, for the sake of the gospel. How? Because actually, he is free. You see, he knows very, very well the freedom of that same gospel, and thus the freedom of the Christian, even yours. As Paul himself had written approximately five years earlier, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
But now, having been set free and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it is this same sweet gospel declared to the Christians in Rome in 55 AD that he declares to the Christians in Ephesus in 60 AD and to the Christians in McCandless in 2024 AD. The freedom of the Christian. The freedom of the Christian is freedom not only from, that is freedom from bondage, freedom from sin, from shame, freedom from condemnation and from death, But it is also paradoxically freedom in, with, and under God. I bow my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. And naming does not refer to just hanging a label onto something. No, the name indicates the reality. And to give a name indicates mastery over something, or taking it under one's protection. Kind of like cattle branding, if you will. And God does not just name, he gives his very own name, from whom the family is named. When Jesus, the Son of God, teaches his brothers and sisters to call upon God as their Father, he teaches that you are truly children of the same Father. And this is not a metaphor. You have received from him the triune name into which the baptismal water placed you. You are named Christian. That is, of and in Christ. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Families come into being through birth, rebirth, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. God's fatherhood is sacramental. Indeed, this whole epistle is baptismal, especially beginning with the latter half of Ephesians, right after our text, Paul spells out how baptism unites, covers, and directs believers in chapter 4, how it reorders relationships in chapter 5, and how it equips you with spiritual armor in chapter 6. So this week, please read on, read on from where we leave off in the epistle text today. But for now, just one example. The Apostle writes at the beginning of chapter 4, and I cite here at some length. He writes, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." That, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Indeed, you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness." These are the very riches of God's glory. His extravagant generosity toward us and his inexhaustible joy, which overflows from his fatherly heart through the Spirit unto and into your inner man. You see, through baptismal faith in Christ, something new has been born in you. A new man, a new creature, strengthened with the Spirit's might. That new creature has emerged and arisen, recreated as a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. In this way, says St. Paul, Christ dwells in you. 
Now, did you catch that? I mean, it surpasses all understanding. It, it is more than you can ask or think or imagine. But know this, believe this, trust this. Christ dwells in your heart. He has put himself there by water and the word, by body and blood, by the preaching of his spirit. Christ lives in you. Perhaps we hear it so often that it ceases to amaze. But Christ lives in each and every one of you. And note well, this is not at all because of your love for him. No, it is because of his unconditional love for you. It is that love in which you have been rooted and grounded, engrafted like a branch on a tree. This is the love of Christ, Christ's love that surpasses all knowledge. Yet, and as a fruit of this love, you do truly comprehend with all the saints, that is, in the fellowship of the church, you comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth of that love. You comprehend, you apprehend, you lay hold of, you, you cleave to, you, you grasp, you cling to this love as it lays hold of you. As you are Christ's, so Christ is yours. The darkness could not comprehend this light, but you can and do, for it is yours as gift. Embraced and embracing, enveloped and enveloping. And so there is something that surpasses all knowledge, something which can never be expressed exactly and precisely by defining terms according to reason, but which nonetheless is real, and which through personal experience, by being met by it in life and being engaged by it, you can learn to know as the truest thing of all, indeed as the good and the beautiful, as even the way and the life. This is the fullness of God himself. This is the exceedingly abundant life. This is what Jesus came to give and has given to you. The verdict of guilt was handed down and you were imprisoned. You tried to rationalize it away, but that simply buried it deeply where it gnaws away at you, causing intermittent and painful pangs of shame. And in this way, guilt will never go away. That way is actually an endless bondage unto more and more guilt. And you cannot free yourself. Again, I mean it literally. Because not only are the fortifications of conscience too great and the chains of the law too heavy, but even if you were somehow to escape, it's a deception. Guilt that is denied is still guilt. Thus a fugitive. And trust me, the law will hunt you down and find you. And there is ultimately no escape. Unless. Unless one from the outside comes to set you free. Comes into your inner man and takes the guilt away. As we sing at Easter, From sin's power, Lord, set us free. Newborn souls in you to be. The Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, takes your sin away by his atoning death. He who knew no sin became sin, not in a general way, but your sin. It has been nailed and put to death on the cross. In that forgiveness, he has removed it as far as east is from west. He casts it behind his back. He throws it onto the scrap heap of history. It is done for. Death and hell and guilt for you are ended. It is finished. Christ is the end of your guilt. The law hunted him down and found him instead of you. You are not guilty. Don't let Satan... Don't let your conscience, don't let your feelings and emotions fool you. You are not guilty. Your blood ransom has been paid by another. You are free. Or do you not know that in baptism your old man was crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away with, that you should no longer be slaves of sin? 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if you died with Christ, you shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. So reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of the righteousness to God. For sin will no longer be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace. Go, you are free. Amen. 